What is up, guys? Welcome back today. We have a very exciting FOMC day. Chirpow himself will speak live in just about 30 minutes. We are a little later than usual. No worries. What I need from you guys today, smash the like, smash the subscribe, share the stream. Let's get hype. Let's get it going. It's going to be a really spicy day. Last month on the FOMC, the Fed chose to pause or skip despite not really liking that terminology, they did not do an interest rate hike in response to economic conditions. Since then, we've had some more favorable economic data that does suggest the Fed may look to ease into the end of the year, or at least slow down or continue to slow down. However, the data still not quite where the Fed would like it. Employment remains strong, while, un while inflation did actually come down, if we look at the true inflation calculator, showing very close to the Fed's 2% target. Uh, very spicy stuff. So they have indicated using forward guidance that we're going to see a hike today and we're going to see a hike next month of 25 BPS. However, I don't believe we have any more information past that. And so that's what we're working with here. Markets are pricing in 25 BPS as they have been all month. If you look at the Fed rate monitor tool, it shows about a 99% confidence in a 25 BPS this month. Uh, however, we did see a little bit of surprising uh probability there with a 50 50 bps actually sneaking in there with like one or two percent not very likely if the fed does follow their forward guidance we'll see 25 bps today and next month however we may see a mix-up we have seen some things like pac west bank corp uh suffering i believe and in the news and with each interest rate hike we do have further pressure on banks especially on regional banks if you remember seems a long time ago at the beginning of the year these interest rate hikes actually collapsed some banks interesting that that's been put on hold since then we haven't seen more happen and logically we should um not going to get into it too deep but basically the fed told banks you can buy these bonds you'll be fine we're not going to raise rates quickly and then they did in a historic rise all through last year and into this year so it's going to get spicy we have two minutes now two minutes until the interest rate decision is in weirdly for those of you joining the first time they release the rate decision at two and then they speak at 2 30. maybe they give the markets about 30 minutes to figure it out i don't know so what i need from you guys is open up your browsers use google use whatever you want and we're going to look for the interest rate decision live it will be published in one minute 30 seconds. So here's what you do. You look into this Fed interest rate decision. And what we need to do is find something that was published. Not yet. It can't even exist yet. In 15 seconds, it can exist. We're going to look for past hour, however you want to do this, spread out our searches, use different words. And when you find it, guys, we do this every time we crowdsource it, put in the chat, not just the decision, but also put in your source. Please don't just say 25. It's not helpful. We want to be the first to know, the first to have it. That's right. So here we go. It is two o'clock and now we should be able to potentially find it. You guys always find it faster than I do. I'm just going to look at the chat. I'm just going to look at the chat, guys. Popping it out. There we go. Uh, can I see? Ooh. Federal Reserve Ooh. System works every day. 25, Growth according to who? US economy. Google's your source. States, we are the home of the original FOMC meeting, by the way. The Other channels, everybody. Mainstream media started copying us. We've been doing this for years. You found your right home if you're just joining us today. Make sure you jump in the Discord. Jump in the Discord. Forks Factory, 25. All right. All right. Any more confirmation? Uh, jump in the Discord for some airdrops, free Bitcoin. Keep up with our live streams in the community. We're live here Monday, Wednesday, Friday, maybe even more going forward when the market spices up. Also, check out in the video description below, Femex and Fairdesk are our sponsors. They are great crypto exchanges. I use them personally. Highly recommend you sign up. Use my link. You'll get some bonuses and you'll help support the stream. Good stuff. I don't know what this is. They're unlikely to be doing anything here for the next 30 minutes. Very extremely unlikely. So I'm actually going to pause this. Let's take a peek at some stuff going on in markets. In the markets. The dollar 
the most important chart basically to the FOMC stream is the dollar. Typically, when we see interest rates rise, we see the dollar gain strength. That was the case through the meteoric rise of 21 or 22. I'm losing my dates now where uh, the dollar topped out apparently at 115 on the Dixie. We have seen it basically consolidate or distribute whatever you want to call it down at 101. And recently this month, we saw the dollar break that critical support. On our live streams, we've charted this out. We've projected what we thought was going to happen. And essentially, we said, well, a return to that support as resistance would be the logical thing. We have seen that here over the last, just yesterday. It looks like we got very close. We're saying 101.8, 101.66. Uh, and yesterday closed red. We're seeing additional red today. Now, logically, this would suggest that we didn't get a hike, right? However, the dollar does kind of seem to be diverging from these interest rate hikes. And my speculation is that the market sees an end to them. It sees a pivot or a turnaround coming. And so we're not seeing the same impacts that we saw in the previous FOMCs or the previous decisions where markets became extremely volatile, especially the dollar. Uh, however, our favorite, the Bitcoin, not doing anything. Maybe that's uh, just backing up what we were looking at. Bitcoin has been consolidating for two, three days now, looking at some of the lowest historical Bitcoin volatility ever in this year. It did hit a low in January. However, the recent very sluggish non-volatile price action has brought us back to the lows. Now, I want to say maybe some silver lining or interpret this the way you'd like. Low volatility and especially historically low volatility has regularly brought major reversals and price swings to Bitcoin. Typically, we see it can, uh, coil up, get less and less volatile until maybe uh, like a bomb, like a bomb. It explodes into some very strong volatility. And so maybe the catalyst will be today when Chirpow speaks. And again, it's not so much the 25 BPS as the market basically knew was going to happen or was extremely confident in. It's going to be about his speech and what he says. The language he uses, the way he describes the Fed's decisions going into the end of the year, the way he describes the economic conditions. Do we see a more hawkish or a more dovish tone? I think markets are going to be praying for a dovish tone here, uh, essentially looking to pivot, slow down, or stop interest rate hikes, say that they've reached a terminal rate that they feel is necessary to adjust, you know, adjust economic whatever um, conditions. Those are the things that are going to be important here today. Now, typically, we do have a lot of nothing burger or a lot of nonsense talk at these, a lot of repetition, not a lot of information. That may be true today, but I do want to thank you guys for joining us at the home of the FOMC. It's always great to have a big crowd. Uh, enjoy these together, make an event that's kind of, well, let's be real, really boring. We try to make it a little bit more fun. I'm going to do my best today. I didn't want to start with this, but Professor Beans, can you guys send her some good energy? Send her your prayers and thoughts. She is currently in surgery right now, having some cancerous growths removed. Uh, so it's a little stressful day. That's why we're late. That's why we're not live early. And that's why we're probably not going to stick around too long afterwards. Um, Cause I'm a little distracted, but we're going to do our best. We're going to do our best. Um, yeah, yes, yes. We love beans. Professor beans. If we lose her, I don't know where I'll get my analysis from. She does all my homework. I can't do anything without her. She is my rock. She is my rock. Um, it's over 9,000. What's up for, <laughs> I can never say her name, man. For a gentius. What's up, my friend? Let's see who's here. If you're here today, please put something in the chat. Let me know you're here so I can shout you out. If you haven't subscribed to this channel, join us. For the home of the FOMC, the greatest crypto channel, the home of crypto right here, the best people. Uh, we do have a subscriber already, Narendra Mainali. Welcome, Narendra. Hopefully I pronounced that right. I see Andres Felipe, Perez, Angelo, Dema, Barry, Tay, Linder, Bin Chicken, Bitcoin Trading, Believes Crypto. How you doing, brother? Blue Cheese, Brendan, Brian B, Brucey, Kibitz. Ooh, here comes the names. Beans and rice for me. Sean with a dollar sign. Uh, CB, Christopher Buchanan, C-Ron, Crypto Carnage, Crypto Fanatic, Cryptogenic Dude, Dandy, Darko, David, Detox Dad, Dr. Crypto, M. Jacqua, Aaron Pym, FinTube, Francisco Perez, FUD Expert, Fujata Bluss, George Caraganius, as always, good to see you here. Gobble Z, House of O, in the moment. 
Uh, wow, the names are popping up. Keep them coming, boys and girls. James Island, James Picard, James O. I'm going to try to get through them. Just keeps losing my spot here. Uh, Jason, K uh, Caitlin, J. Marie, Salera, J. Baker, Jeff Edmonds, Jimmy, John Arlo, John Doe, John Foster, Josel, Jose Salazar, Joshelder, Karen, Karen Harris. How you doing? Karen, KC, Kelly Boy, Kevin Luxury Coco. Krishna Kumar, AC, Chris Pax, what's up, my bro? Crunk C, Kyle G, Lawrence Believer, Lee Cable, Liquidation Expert. Dude, these names are popping up so fast that it keeps pushing where I am on the list down, and it's actually very difficult, but I'm going to do my best. Loading name, I didn't forget you, my friend. Uh, Lorenzo Sa, holy shit. This is really hard to keep up with. 5G, Acid Monkey, Alex S, Alan Daniel, Andy D. We got a bunch of new names. Big Hands Little Spoon. Big Hands Little Spoon, baby. Uh, Bravo meme, meme coin, Brett McMaster. Bro tips here. How you doing, bro tip? Uh, ba ba I butchered that. Cheap vlog, Cre chemo and crypto. Good to see you. Cherry City Bull Bullies. Coins check, the beautiful coins check. How you doing, darling? Great article on render. Claps to you. Check out crownanalysis.com for crypto news updates. A lot of them written by coins check. She's cute too. It doesn't hurt. Uh, let me get, see if I can actually get through this goddamn list. Let me go from the bottom up. Monkey, Yvonne, beautiful Yvonne's here. Worsten Broge, Wick, Vlad Yusitenko, Vishharts, Trekking Travelers, Tor, Tonzi Norman, The Rusty Man, The Orang Flame, Pickle, my right-hand guy, Pickle, The Angry Bear, T-Bone, how you doing, T-Bone, Sakrat Babar, Steve Palmer, Stefan Hobie, Steph Mees, Sproxy, Spaceland, Sled, Shrump, Dumplet, Sholim Shoixi, Shavim Singh, Sergi, Sino DB, Scotty Don't P, Sarah Aziz, Sam James, Ryu, Ryu Kedin, Ryan Oligeni, Rule, Rao Boat, Rockinanor, Rich on Richiani, Raphael Marty, Randy Greer, Randy Albert, Queens here, how you doing, Queen? Pink Floaty, Fori Ryo Gentius, Petey Might, Peter Mighty, Pest Killers, Pepito, Patrick. Horror body one a day. Holy hell, there's so many of us here, fam. This is wild. I haven't even looked at how many people are watching. I'm assuming it is a ton based on how many people are chatting. Ninja Glock, No Eggs, No Bird, Oh My Optic Earth, I gotta go fast. Netstar, Neaton Puri, Neba Josa, NBF Forum, Nayen Dodia, Nate, Quantum Divergence, Nabil Khan, Mutant Ape, Muhammad Nazi, Mr. Panda, Andy Walk, Mr. Toe, Mr. Rowe, Mohad Harfiq, Muhammad Jafari M, Mike LSU, Mike D. Fitness Journey, Michael Bolden, Michael Butler, Matthew Miller, Marty R, Mark Sanji, Mark Harris, Manila, Mohammed Rafiq, Magnus Larson, Lux Algo. Shout out to Lux Algo. Sign up using my link. Uh, M, Samantha Shorma, Luigi Markin, LT. Lorenzo Sa. I, I got a lot of them. I can't get everybody. Dude, there's hundreds and hundreds. They just keep, I can't read faster. I don't even know how to read, guys. I was, I was guessing at what letters they were. I was guessing. We have a lot of people here chatting. What's up, Tommy G, Willow, George Coleman, Ian F, C R, Jim Kennedy, Voram, and Qu Jonas, Johannes, Joker's Wild. I can't do them all. How are you guys feeling today on this FOMC? Hopefully, you got some good vibes flowing. I'm curious while we have a minute, what do you guys think about this UFO stuff? I have a feeling you're going to love it. When Gina, Gina now, Gina now. What's up, director of Gifty with the check mark? Yo, my guy, how are you doing? Jason Casper sleeping. He's probably uh, hoeing his yard. I can't believe you called me Sino. <laughs> Shano, Sean, Shano, DB? I don't know. I was going fast. What's up, Atticus Rex? I said your name. Let's go, Kaya. Let's go, Kaya Reacts. What are we doing? The wormhole that opened up. Well, we had a good run, guys. I guess we won't even make it through this. A wormhole opened up. We're all, we're all going to get sucked in by UFOs or something. On the treadmill, hell yeah. You too. Wait, Mitch Ray's here? I didn't see him. If he is here. Oh, there he is. To my man, Mitch Ray. How you doing, my friend? Are you still in the, uh, in the big city? Your name is Tillin McPooch. Tillian. Tillian McPooch. I like it. Joking about the wormhole. That's good news. That's good news. All right. We've got about 15 minutes until your pal. Let's also, we're, we're praying for uh, Professor Beans today. Let's also pray that Gina has uh, some extra questions. Maybe uh, finally notices us in our love for her. Gina, you are the best. You are absolutely the best, Gina. Whew. Good times. Good times. Very good times.
Surprisingly, we've only had one new subscriber. I, that seems impossible to me with 2,000 viewers. Keep it hyping. Can we get 1,000 likes? Can we do it quick? Can we get 1,000 likes? And can we get 1,000 new subscribers? Maybe. Perhaps. Perhaps not. We'll see. Either way, it's going to be spicy. I didn't even set up the traditional FOMC chart. That's pretty JV of me. Maybe I'll do that while, I get, while we kind of chill here. Am I going to play Powell live? Oh, I'm going to play him live. Oh, I'm going to play him like a fiddle live. All right. Like a friddle. Let's uh, really quick just mark on our charts here. We got the 2 o'clock interest rate decision. Bitcoin trading sideways into it. Unusual, actually. We don't typically see that really sideways trading directly into it. In general, we see the market trending in one direction until the time of the decision. And then it typically reverses. And then it typically reverses again when Chirpao speaks, uh, resulting in kind of a net just earthquake uh, leverage, destruction, etc. Uh, here we go. Let's mark when Chirpal's on. Ba bam. Ba 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 bang. Here we go. There it is. And there it is. All right. Bitcoin sideways. Unusual. Little volatility with some highs and lows, but very, very, very close. Not a lot of price action. I'll say it's sideways. S&P 500 does appear to be trending up. Now, it was sideways into the decision, but we're seeing one, two, three green candles in a row. Bitcoin actually kind of similar. The S&P, I'll say, is trending up a little bit right now. And the dollar with a heavy, heavy one-minute candle there down 0.14%. That's a good amount for the dollar in one minute. Heavy. Why is that so far away? Oh, there we go. Got it. All right, our chart's set up. We got it. We're nobody. We're not disorganized. We're totally organized. Everybody. We're totally organized. All right. Uh, should we get maybe some tunes? Do we have enough time for tunes? I'm so used to having like an hour that we just kind of like shoot the shit beforehand. This time it's, it's just it's all work, no play, baby. Gina, 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 notice me, Gina. Ooh, Bitcoin, low green, low green. We're on the one minute chart, guys, so I do want to remind you, please don't, I don't know, get super excited with, uh, okay, I mean, maybe get a little more excited, maybe a little more than we were. Bitcoin moving up to 29.5, not bad. Uh, S&P kind of pairing gains as well, and the dollar, what looks like a one minute bear flag. Oh, yeah, so don't get too excited. Don't think it's the end of the world or the, I don't know step before the moon by the way i do want to remind you these events are typically extremely volatile and we can even see with this little push up on bitcoin a wick on the top extremely volatile and they're very dangerous times to trade i don't recommend having trades open during this you're very likely to get stopped out long or short whether you're in the right direction or not we usually see a wick to the upside and downside that was kind of described in the trend into the decision then the reversal uh, after the decision and then reversal again after chirp house start speaking uh great way to lose money if you're you know you're a pro out there and you don't care just practice safe risk management that's all i ask and hey if you really really have to trade use my link sign up with femex or fairdesk links in the video description below uh at least it'll help support the stream a small percent of the fees collected go to me instead of the exchange it's a good setup it's a win-win you get bonuses uh helps keep the stream going uh you always come to this channel for the FOMC, Jonathan Borazjani. I was going really fast. I was butchering names left and right. Good to have you back, my friend. Good to have you back. What was that? Whoa. I thought I saw someone say, ah, howdy from Estonia. Rigo Kopel. We have people from all around the world. That's what makes us so spicy. I love it. Uh, I was just in Estonia in May. Beautiful country. Beautiful. Loved it. Had a great time. Will return. Actually, that was April, I think. I will be back in April. Solana poppin'. Chirp pow. Can I get a chirp? Can I get a chirp pow in chat? A chat pow, perhaps? They're just replaying this over and over again. Can I get a chat pow? A chirp pow? Okay. Let's take a look at stuff that's moving here today. We're going to look in the last hour. Dogecoin up 2%. Seemingly showing strength Dogecoin off of Twitter's rebranding to X. 
I, I, X is a cooler word than Twitter. However, the new branding, I don't know what Elon's doing. I don't like it. I don't like things that change. I'm old. I like things to be the same in the way I know them. Um, seems to be off, uh, maybe showing some strength off of that. As he has alluded again to integrating Dogecoin into the platform, looking to become the everything platform, the everything app. That's a pretty cool idea. Theta Network up 1.7%. No one's talked about that in a while. Stellar and XRP holding on to their spots here. Biggest losers. Not a lot in the last hour. Screw Flex Coin. Don't care. Compound Solana up a little bit. Caspa up a little bit. Biggest gainers in the last week. XDC Network Maker Caspa Dogecoin Trust Wallet Chainlink. Not bad. Not bad. Let's see if there's anything in the micros. No, nah, not that I recognize. Kind of remember OGN, but I don't own any. Mm -hmm. Cryptocurrency moons down still at 35 cents, basically where we left it on Monday. Not a big deal. Not a lot of change. What about stonks? Are stonks moving? SP 500 VIX is down 1%. So we're seeing a decline in volatility. NASDAQ down about a quarter percent. S&P about 0.2. Dow Jones weirdly up 0.1. Kind of going against the grain of everything else there. Bonds down. 10-year yield down half a percent. 30-year down half a percent. 5-year down half a percent. 3-month up. And 10-year T-note up. However, the 10 to 2-year bond yield invasion. It's plus a negative... <laughs> plus a negative 5.6%. That's confusing. What about the stocks? Apple... Chilling at all time highs. Alphabet up huge. Maybe we'll even look at Google if we have time. Alphabet up huge off of earnings. 6% today. That's quite a move. Tesla down but relatively flat. Amazon down but relatively flat. Netflix losing a little bit of ground here. Minus 2% on the day. Meta up 1.6. Bank of America 0.5. Is there anything breaking other than the UFOs? Do you guys believe in UFOs? That should be the next gen. We have 1,000 votes in our poll. Hell yeah. Hell yeah, that's a lot of votes. We have 480 likes. Blue past 420, guys. Well done. This is the first time we've gotten our 420 license in a while. I appreciate it. I need it today. Thank you. Let's get to 1,000 likes, though. We can do that right now with all of the 2,000 viewers. We can get to 1,000 likes. All you have to do is pick up your finger, put it on your mouse or your mobile device, and click that little thumbs up. Then while you're at it, you might as well subscribe, hit the bell. Yeah, and join the Discord. I like it. Let's do a, an alien poll. Yeah. <laughs> Do you believe? Do you believe in aliens? Yes. And they've visited us. Yes, but they have not been here. Not sure. And nope. No way. Jose. There we go. A little bit of fun. A little bit of alien poll. Go ahead and vote while we get those likes up. While we wait for Chirpow. Only 10 minutes to go. Only 10 minutes. We're at the cusp of POW. The cusp POW. Uh, most popular news. Fed hike, yeah. Further squeeze on inflation following June skip. U.S. stocks were wobbling ahead of Fed, uh, Fed's decision. Microsoft and Alphabet earnings. I guess uh, Alphabet earnings were probably decent considering they're just at all-time highs. Microsoft and Alphabet posted better than anticipated quarterly earnings. Growth accelerated, Azure Cloud. Yeah, all right, they're both up, cool. I was looking for something spicy, but I don't see any spices. Analysts bullish on Google's results. Yep, seems everyone's bullish on Google. Hunter Biden judge says, can't accept plea deal and surprise turn. Don't care, that's not economic news. Uh, global shares, US yields, pullback as Fed rate hike looms. Charting. The, ooh, charting the Fed's policy path? I better see a goddamn chart. There's no charts. That was clickbait. I got clickbaited, guys. It's okay. Do you believe in aliens are my... Well, the poll does have yes, and they visited us. Yes, but they haven't been here. I don't know, and no, I don't. There's all the answers. It's all the answers. All the answers you could want. They're not from another planet. They're from here. Well, that would make them not aliens then, Josh. They're from here. They're native. They're not aliens. That would just make them not human, maybe. What's up, cybersecurity? Time to travel. Crunk. Carl. 
also mystic. Jaya, you, I don't know what that is. Mathematically impossible for aliens not to exist, says Chemo. Sure, but are they here or are they not here? I don't know. In control of AI. That's some crazy conspiracy, man. That's some, I like it, Paul Wood. Ace XRP, alien news is great for misdirection. Ace XRP, nailing it on the head here. This, there's something else going on today. And we have the Fed meeting, but the Fed meeting and this alien stuff, it very much feels like there is something being swept under the rug. That's why I opened up the news hoping that maybe there'd be a hint. Maybe the bank, maybe some banks collapsing. Could be, could be. Uh, that's probably where I put my money, but not in the bank. You heard the aliens are getting in through the southern border. Yep, that clearly stick. Yep. The aliens that are from here. <laughs> I like it. I like it. WTF is WLD coin Matrala AF a bunch of garbage. That's about what I know. Hey, Tom, do you believe the X payment system is going to use XRP rather than Doge? No, not at all. Why would we think that? Why would we think that at all? Cybersecurity. I'm not really sure why it's using Doge, but... Die. There is nothing to my knowledge that links XRP and the, the Twitter X. Now, what I could see is if Elon does actually pull this off, because I believe there were some articles recently uh, quoting Musk, essentially saying that the task wasn't as easy as he thought it would be, the surprise, uh, to incorporate Dogecoin. But what I could see is after incorporating Dogecoin or whatever it is, then adding more tokens, because you assume they're going to add Bitcoin. They're going to start with Doge. They're going to add Bitcoin. Uh, it's a no-brainer. And maybe that will include XRP as well. But uh, to my knowledge, there's been literally zero connection between the two. XRP and X... Duh, I don't know what that means. I don't know what that means. Oh. <laughs> Is that... Uh, dude, that seems like enough for XRP people to go on. It's an X. It's called X Corp. XRP confirmed. All right. I mean, I'll take it. That's, that's proof. Limp, loop ring doing things says CR. Yeah, what are you guys looking at? Is there anything spicing? Sundown is the 9th of AV. That's the day that... I don't know what that means. Kenny Carneal, but I like it. I like it. Still voting Pedro? That's the way to go. Yeah, dude. It, we're going to do FOMC, but now we're just talking aliens because we got like five minutes. So we're just like talking aliens, talking Twitter, talking trash. Nate, the financial committee is voting amendments on the FIT21 and blockchain regulatory cleared Yak bill today. Like right now, financial services, GOP, YouTube. We probably should have had that up instead of talking about aliens. But hey, what do I know? What do I do? Let me see. Financial service. Ooh, look at us. Look at us. Look at us right here on my own homepage. Hey, that's me. What's up, me? How you doing, me? How you doing? Markup, is this it? Who the hell are you, Ricky Gutierrez? Who's this guy? It's probably a stock guy. I look at that. What's this guy? What's he do? 1.15 million subscribers. Well, hey, sorry, Ricky. I was talking shit. You're killing it. Okay, well, this doesn't seem to have happened. Oh, maybe it is. Well, this seems boring. They're also not... They're, like, probably out to lunch at this point. Ricky, you're right. It was the second one. I wonder if we can find it really quick. Because we allow technology that holds these values at their core to flourish. Hmm. The next phase of the digital economy, the ownership economy, consists of a trusted, immutable mechanism for transferring value in real time over. All right, Mr. Rammer. Enter crypto, a technology that can shift economic power from centralized institutions that uh, some of my colleagues seem to support. Uh, at the uh, expense of the people, instead it. of supporting those centralized institutions, it turns the power back into the hands of the people. It's transformational. The sense of urgency Who to is this guy? a globally competitive framework for digital assets that catalyze domestic innovation like and give Americans the confidence they need to engage with this technology Tater tots has for lunch. never been more important yeah. than it is now. Yeah. The European Union is implementing its markets in digital assets framework to regulate a large swath of the digital asset ecosystem from tokens to exchanges, and they're ensuring legal clarity this. for innovators. The UK His name's Tom Emmer? Increasing right. clarity in supporting the adoption of cryptocurrencies in the country. 
Hong Kong is even throwing its hat in the ring, creating a Web3 task force and opening up its financial system to digital asset companies. I like this If guy. Congress does nothing, the United States will I'm miss bummed. a huge opportunity and Americans will suffer for it. What would the internet look like today if it had been designed by the Chinese Communist Party? We have an opportunity to lead globally in designing a future digital economy powered by digital assets that advance American values of privacy, like individual sovereignty, and free markets. The yeah, Financial like Services Committee has come a long way in taking up these issues Smoking since I started days, working sure. on digital asset policy back in 2015, and today's markup sure. represents sure. a great commitment to capture the opportunities presented by this technology. I look forward to continuing to work with you, Chair McHenry, sure, uh, and McHenry. Chair Hill, and everybody uh, else sure, who's involved McHenry. in this, and the industry, so that sure, we can McHenry. educate our membership and make sure we get mm. this legislation right the first time. Thank you, and I yield back. As the gentleman will yield. Tom Emmer. All right. Well, all right. So there should needs have to that. be a legislative framework here. Blockchain technology. I like when they say blockchain. Been in recent years, a new and developing technology. Keep piping the likes and subscribe. Result of innovation Jeez. and investment. Woden. And that of could course, be you, Woden, son. The regulatory framework. Thanks for subscribing. Good to have. Generally you. comes after because it is responding to the changes in technology. We've got exactly two minutes before Chirpao. Two minutes. Two minute warning. Go grab your brews. Roll one. Get comfortable. Because it's Chirpao time. Dang, is there really 11,000 people? There's 15,000 people watching the FOMC on the Federal Reserve. Wow. Well, they don't have, a, they don't have live chats. So like, why would you even go there? Why would you even, why would you even go there? They don't have live chat. But there's 16,000. Holy shit. Holy shit. 16,000. And I thought our 2,000 was big. I thought when we had like 5,000, that was big. Rookie numbers. Rookie numbers. Let's pop this up. Oh, what's up, Jimmy Raw's subscribing. Good to have you, Jimmy. Welcome. Comes, you may. Oh, the most epic waiting music ever. Oh. Oh, there we go. I don't know where to put this. Somewhere. Somewhere. We should be starting up in T minus 30 seconds. They are usually a little late, though. Be real, usually late. Give it 60 seconds max. In the meantime, you have just enough time to subscribe, like, join the Discord. You have just enough time, I promise. You can do it. Also, vote in the poll. Say something in the chat, engage. Looks like dollar is back to where it started its sell off. Let's make this bigger really quickly. This is kind of cool. The dollar right here behind me. Back to where it began on the interest rate decision. What is up, Phil D, my man? Thanks for subscribing. Atticus Rex. Super chat at $5. Come on, people. Smash the likes. He, he's got a point. Stocks relatively back to where they were. Bitcoin, where it started. Now it's starting. Chirp. A chirp. Hey. Chirp. Hey. He's always late. It's like his thing. Is he, I think he's a rock star. Like He's literally always late. Never starts on time. There he is. No one clapped. They don't usually clap, but no one clapped this time. Embarrassing. Embarrassing. Give me an audio check. Good afternoon. <clears throat> My colleagues and I remain squarely focused on our dual mandate to promote maximum employment and stable prices for is the American people. Is he a robot? People. We understand the hardship that high inflation is causing, and we remain strongly committed to bringing inflation back down to our 2% goal. Word for word. Goal. Every meeting, word for word. Price stability is the responsibility of the Federal Reserve. 
Without price stability, the economy doesn't work for anyone. In particular, without price stability, we will not achieve a sustained period of strong labor market Is conditions. Is this word for word what he said last time? Since early last year, the FOMC has significantly tightened the stance of monetary policy. Today, we took another step by raising our policy interest rate a quarter percentage point, and we are continuing to reduce our securities holdings at a brisk pace. We've covered a lot of ground, and the full effects of our tightening have yet to be felt. Looking ahead, we will continue to take a data-dependent approach in determining the extent of additional policy firming that may be appropriate. I'll have more to say about monetary policy after briefly reviewing economic developments. Recent indicators suggest that economic activity has been expanding at a moderate pace. Growth in consumer spending appears to have slowed from earlier in the year. Although activity in the housing sector has picked up somewhat, it remains well below levels of a year ago, largely reflecting higher mortgage rates. And higher interest rates and slower output growth also appear to be weighing on business fixed investment. The labor market remains very tight. Over the past three months, job gains averaged 244,000 jobs per month, uh, a pace below that seen earlier in the year, but still a strong pace. The unemployment rate remains low at 3.6%. There are some continuing signs that supply and demand in the labor market are coming into better balance. The labor force participation rate has moved up since last year particularly for individuals aged 25 to 54 years. Nominal wage growth has shown, shown some signs of easing, and job vacancies have declined so far this year. While the jobs to workers gap has narrowed, labor demand still substantially exceeds the supply of available workers. Inflation remains well above our longer run goal of 2%. Over the 12 months ending in May, total PCE prices rose 3.8%, excluding the volatile food and energy categories, core PCE prices rose 4.6%. In June, uh, the 12 month change in the consumer price index, or CPI, came in at 3.0%, and the change in the core, core CPI was 4.8%. Inflation has moderated somewhat since the middle of last year. Nonetheless, the process of getting inflation back down to 2% has a long way to go. Despite elevated inflation, longer-term inflation expectations appear to remain well anchored, as reflected in a broad range of surveys of households, businesses, and forecasters, as well as measures from financial markets. The Fed's monetary policy actions are guided by our mandate to promote maximum employment and stable prices for the American people. My colleagues and I are acutely aware that high inflation Acute. imposes are, significant, significant hardship as it erodes Acute. purchasing power, especially for those least able to meet the higher cost of essentials like food, housing, and transportation. And uh, everyone. We're highly attentive to the risks that high inflation poses to both sides of our mandate, and we are strongly committed to returning to inflation to our 2% objective. No, no way. At today's meeting, the committee raised the target range for the federal funds rate by a quarter percentage point, bringing the target range to five and a quarter to five and a half percent. We are also continuing the process of significantly reducing our securities holdings. With today's action, we've raised our policy rate by five and a quarter percentage points since early last year. We have been seeing the effects of our policy tightening on demand in the most interest rate sensitive sectors of the economy, particularly housing and investment. It will take time, however, for the full effects of our ongoing monetary restraint to be realized, especially on inflation. In addition, the economy is facing headwinds from tighter credit conditions for households and businesses, which are likely to weigh on economic activity, hiring, and inflation. In determining the extent of additional policy firming that may be appropriate to return inflation to 2% over time, the committee will take into account the cumulative tightening of monetary policy, the lags with which monetary policy affects economic activity and inflation, and economic and financial developments. We will continue to make our decisions meeting by meeting based on the totality of the incoming data and their implications for the outlook for economic activity and inflation, as well as the balance of risks. We remain committed to bringing inflation back to our 2% goal and to keeping longer-term inflation expectations well anchored. 
Reducing inflation is likely to require a period of below trend growth and some softening of labor market conditions. Restoring price stability is essential to set the stage for achieving maximum employment and stable prices over the longer run. To conclude, we understand that our actions affect communities, families, and businesses across the country. Everything we do is in service to our public mission. We at the Fed will do everything we can to achieve our maximum employment and price stability goals. I take a nap. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Steve. Get the next Mr. One. Chairman, thank you. Um, you have, I think a couple times in your opening remarks, talked about this language in determining the extent of additional policy firming that may be appropriate. Should we take that to mean that additional hikes are likely on the way? And should we also believe that all future meetings, say September and November, are live, or are you in a every other meeting mode? Thank you. So we haven't made a decision to go to every other meeting. It's not something we've looked at. We're going to be going meeting by meeting. And uh, as we go into each meeting, we're going to be asking ourselves the same question. So we haven't made any decisions about, about any future meetings, including the pace we'll at which we consider data. hiking. But we're going to be assessing the need for uh, further tightening that may be appropriate. You, you read the language to return inflation to 2% mm -hmm. over time. Um, I would say, say that, that the intermeeting data came in broadly in line with expectations. Economic activity remained resilient. Job creation remained strong while cooling a bit. And the June CPI report actually came in a bit better than expectations Dovish. for a change. Dovish, Dovish, um, Dovish. And the June CPI report, of course, was welcome, but it's only one report, one month's data. Uh, we hope that inflation will follow a lower path as, uh, as was, but it will be consistent with the CPI reading. But we don't know that, and we're just going to need to see more data. So what are we going to be looking at? Is. Really, it will be the, broader, the whole broader picture. And starting with, um, we're looking for moderate growth, right? We're looking for uh, supply and demand through the economy coming into better balance, um, inclu including in particular in the labor market. We'll be looking at inflation. And we'll be asking ourselves, does this whole collection of data, as, do we assess it as suggesting that we need to raise rates further? And if we make that conclusion, then we will go ahead and raise rates. So that's that's how we're thinking about the next meeting, and uh, you know how we're thinking about meetings going forward potentially. But you know we're, we're now mainly thinking about the next meeting. I will also say, uh, since we're talking about it, um, between now and the September meeting, we get two more job reports, two more CPI reports. I think we have an ECI report coming later this week, which is Employment uh, Compensation Index. Uh, and lots of data on economic activity. All of that information is going to inform our decision as we go into that meeting. I would say it is certainly possible that we would raise funds again at the September meeting if the data warranted. it. And I would also say it's that possible that we would choose to hold steady at that meeting. We're hmm. going to be making careful assessments, as I said, meeting do. by meeting. It's possible um, we don't. And I'll close so by saying we've raised I the federal funds question. right now by 525 basis points since March 2022. Monetary policy, we believe, is restrictive and is putting downward pressure on economic activity and inflation. If I could just briefly follow up on something you said If you could you just answer there. any question. You said the data in the intermediate yes. period, uh, it broadly came in uh, in line with expectations. Does that mean there's unlikely to have been a change in the uh, overwhelming outlook of the committee that two more hikes are necessary? I'm just going to go back to what I said. We, we, you know, th that's the question. We have eight weeks now until the September meeting and all that data that I recited. We're going to be looking at all of that and making that assessment then. And, and really, we, we did have the one good reading. Real quick. Guys, does does Jerome Powell sound like a chat GBT bot? He doesn't answer the questions. He just like answers around the question. For rates for, for inflation to remain low. But we just don't know that until we see the data. So we'll be focusing on that. Yeah, you're supposed to have Gina. the data. Gina! Shut up, everybody. It's Gina. Shut up. Thanks for taking our questions, Chair Powell. Um, obviously, you upgraded the language around growth in the statement Ooh, she's today. Looking good. You know, we've yeah. seen the Barbie movie numbers. We've seen everyone going to Taylor Swift concerts this oh. summer. It seems like the American consumer is in pretty good shape. And it does seem like growth is sort of picking back up a little bit or at least doing well. And I wonder from your perspective if that continues, if we see growth not just stabilizing but doing you know, performing well this summer. Like is that good. a problem because it's inflationary or is it good news because it suggests that a soft landing is more likely? Just how are you thinking about that sort of trajectory? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so... Your hair looks um, great. I would say it this way. The overall resilience of the economy, the fact that, that um, we've been able to achieve disinflation so far without any meaningful uh, negative impact on the labor market, the strength of the economy, it, overall... Um, 
that's a good thing. It's good to see that, of course. It's also you see consumer, to co consumer confidence coming up and things like that. That will support e activity going forward. But you're, you're right, though. At the margin, stronger growth could lead over time to higher inflation, and that would require an appropriate response for monetary policy. So we'll be watching that carefully and uh, seeing how it evolves over time. Neil. Gino. Uh, More thanks, questions Chair from Neil Gino. Rowan from uh, Axios. Hey. So as you referenced earlier, Triple. in the intermediate period, soft CPI, jobs reports, uh, still strong but moderating, uh, jolts look <clears> good. Uh, so if you're data dependent, why not pause again? Why not stay on hold? Why not take another meeting off when no, the data not? was at least cutting in the direction you want to see? Data. So um, if you go back to uh, the data what we're trying to do here. We're trying to achieve a stance of policy that's sufficiently restrictive to bring inflation down to 2%. Word At the word. last meeting, we wrote down our individual estimates of that would take, of what that would take, and the median of that was, was, uh, was an additional two rate hikes. So I, I would say we looked at the interim, interim, intermediate data, and as I mentioned, broadly consistent, not perfectly consistent, but broadly consistent with expectations, and as a result, we went ahead and, and took another step. Uh, and that's you know a labor market that continues to be strong, but but gradually slowing. Um, I, I mentioned that the inflation report was actually a little better than expected, but you know we're we're going to be careful about taking too much signal from from a single reading. And um, you know growth came in stronger than expected, so that's how we look at it. And and so we did take that step today. Dollar is dumping. Stocks up, Bitcoin Rose, relatively flat Journal. still. Uh, Chair Powell, markets uh, widely believe the median Chair FOMC Powell. participants' inflation forecast uh, from June for the fourth quarter of this year will be too high, given autos and shelter. Uh, and that by September, that may warrant a downward revision in the inflation forecast of 20 to 30 basis points. Would that type of inflation progress be enough to hold rates steady from here, or do you need to see below trend growth and decelerating labor income to growth see that data. to be convinced that you've done enough? It, so it's hard to pick the pieces apart and say, you know, how much of this and how much of that. You know, we'll, yeah. be, we'll be looking at everything. And, uh, you know, we'll, of course, we'll be looking to see whether the signal from June CPI is replicated or, or the opposite of replicated or whether it's somewhere in the middle. We'll be looking at the growth data. We'll be looking at the labor market data very closely, of course, and mm -hmm. making an overall judgment about that. It's, it's the totality of the data, I think, but with a particular focus on, on making progress on inflation. If I could follow up, last month you said there were benefits to moderating the pace of increases because it would give you more information to make decisions. Mm -hmm. Would another really CPI high. report like the one we just had in June allow you to at least maintain that slower pace and defer until the fall any decision on whether you need that second rate hike. So I'm just going to tell you again Keep what we're going to do in thing. September. We're going to look at, at two additional job we'll reports, we're, we're two additional CPI reports, lots of activity data. Uh, and that's what we're going to look at, and we're going to make that decision then. And that decision could, could mean another hike in, in September, or it could mean that we decide to maintain at that level. And Welcome again, the question we're going to be asking ourselves is, is the, is the overall signal one that we need to do more, that we need to tighten further? And if we get that signal whenever we get it, then, and that's the collective judgment of the committee, then we'll, we will move ahead. If we don't, you know, then, then um, we'll have the option of, of maintaining policy at that level. But it's, it's, you know, it's, it's really dependent so much on the data, and we just don't have it yet. Can someone get this man the data? Can someone get him the data? He needs Hi, data. What's uh, up, Paul? Chris Rugeber at Associated get Press. Data, so uh, consumer confidence in the economy is rising. Uh, likely in large part because of, of the declines in headline inflation. You also see wages are also rising faster than prices now uh, after trailing them for a long time. How much are Americans truly uh, harmed by inflation at its current level, headline level of 3%? And with that in mind, when do you put some weight back on the employment side of the dual mandate? So I guess I'd say it this way. Um, First, it is, it is a good thing that headline inflation has come down so much, because that's really what the public experience is. And, and I, I would say that having it, headline inflation move down that much almost creates a, it, it will strengthen the broad sense that, that the public has that inflation is coming down, which will in turn, we hope, help, help inflation continue to move down. Um, so you are really, sorry, but what your question was? Well, I mean, you've talked for many press conferences now about the harm created by inflation, how hard yeah. it is for people. To, so how much of that are we still seeing with inflation now down at three? So I guess I would put it this way. We, we, um, 
I'd say it this way. It's really a question of how do you balance the two risks, the risk of doing too much or doing too little. And, you know, we, I would say that, um, you know, we're coming to a place where, where there really are risks on both sides. It's hard to say exactly whether, whether they're in balance or not. But as our, as our stances become more restrictive we, and inflation moderates, we do increasingly face that risk. But, um, you know, we, we need to see that inflation is durably down that far. We, you know, as, as you know, we think and most economists think that core inflation is actually a better signal of where, of, of where headline inflation is going because headline inflation is affected greatly by volatile uh, energy and food prices. So we would want core inflation to be coming down because that's what we think it, that's core in, is, is signaling where head, headline is going to go in the future. And core inflation is still pretty elevated. You know, there's reason to think it, it can come down now, but it's, it's still quite elevated. And so we think we need to stay on task, uh, and we think we're going to need to hold, certainly hold policy at a restricted levels for some time. And we need to be prepared to raise further if, that, if we think that's appropriate. Well, and then if inflation were to, just a quick follow, uh, if it stays at three or drops even a little bit more, I mean, how much of an increase in unemployment do you think is acceptable to get that last bit of inflation? People are talking about the potential difficulty of the last so-called last mile of inflation. So but how much, again, how much unemployment do you think is justified to get down that last So it, it, it is, it is um, the data. a very positive thing that actually the unemployment rate is the same as it was when we lifted off in March of 22 no. at 3.6 percent. So that's a real blessing and that we've been able to achieve some disinflation. Um, and we don't seek to, it's not that we're aiming to, to raise unemployment, but I would just say the historical record, we have to be honest about the historical record, which does suggest that when central banks go in and slow the economy to bring down inflation, the result tends to be some softening in labor market conditions. And so that is still the, the likely outcome here. Um, and, you know, we hope that that's as, li as little as possible. We have to be honest that that, that, is, that that is the likely outcome. The worst outcome for everyone, of course, would be not to deal with inflation now, not get it done. Uh, whatever the short-term social costs of getting inflation under control, the longer-term social costs of failing to do so are, are greater. And that the, the historical record is very, very clear on that. If you go through a period where inflation expectations are not anchored, inflation is volatile, it interferes with people's lives and with economic activity, and you know that's the that's the thing we 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 really need to avoid and will avoid. Chapow, chapow, chapow. At this point, you say uh, the policy uh, is restrictive, but all year long we have seen growth surprise to the upside, unemployment to the downside, and inflation lately to the downside. So I'm wondering, uh, by definition, should you be restrictive enough right now under these mm -hmm. conditions? Do you think you might need to do more? Because I'm curious about what you see as inflation dynamics now. Is the economy still moving in a direction where it creates more inflation? People talk about uh, base effects and higher energy costs, and now we have uh, some large labor settlements. Or is the economy disinflating, uh, and you're just you're able to go back to the old Fed policy of opportunistic disinflation? Mm. So mm -hmm. I'll just say, <clears throat> yes, again, yes. the broader picture of what we want to see uh, is we want to see easing of supply constraints and normalization of pandemic-related distortions to demand and supply. We want to see name. economic growth running at moderate or modest levels to help ease inflationary pressures. We want to see continued restoration of supply and demand balance, particularly in the labor market. And all of that should lead to declining inflationary pr pressures. Now, what we see is we see those pieces of the puzzle coming together, and we're seeing evidence of those things now. But I would, I would say that what what our eyes are telling us is that policy has not been restrictive restrictive enough for long enough to have its full desired effects so we intend to, again to keep policy restrictive until we're confident that inflation is coming down sustainably toward our two percent target and we're prepared to further tighten if that is appropriate and we think the process you know still probably has a, a long way to go well do you think uh, under current hawkish. conditions you are restrictive enough uh, unless something changes well, I think we, th we think, you know, today's rate hike was appropriate, and I think we're going to be looking at the incoming data to inform our data. decision. We just need one scrap of data. Someone get in the data. Guys, keep subscribing. I see you out there. Juan, Ilhan, Kate, Catalin, sin of all of us. Phil D, keep it up, guys.
Give it likes. Thank you. Colby Smith with the Financial Times. Colby? If September is in Colby. fact a, a live meeting, how does that square with the need for a more gradual tightening pace that you spoke of last month in explaining the rationale for holding um, the, the funds rate steady uh, at the June meeting? So a, gr a more gradual pace doesn't go immediately to every other meeting. It could be two out of three meetings, right? It could be. It just means if you, you're slowing down. The point Fraction really was one, to slow two down two the thirds, decision cycle as we, as we get sevens. closer and closer to, we think, our destination. There are many numbers under one. And uh, I, I wouldn't want to go automatically to every other meeting because uh, I just don't think that's – we don't I, – I think it's not a, an environment where we want to provide a lot of forward guidance. It's, there's a lot of uncertainty out there. We just want to keep moving at what we think is the right pace. And I do think it makes all the sense in the world – to slow down as we now make these finely uh, judged uh, decisions. And so that's what we did. And so I, I think it's, it's possible, I mentioned before, it's possible that we would move at consecutive means. We're not taking that off the table, or we might not. It's really going to depend on what the data tell us. That's the best we can do. So we shouldn't assume that every other meeting is the lowest tightening frequency, let's say. It could be, you know, longer intervals in between as well. I, I think we're going to look. I think we're going to we're going to make a decision about the next meeting, and then we're going to make a decision about the one after that. And uh, I think it'll sort itself out. Chirpow, are, are aliens real? Chirpow, uh, uh, Howard Schneider with Reuters. Um, so, so, so uh, among your colleagues, there have been people who've said they feel that very little transmission uh, has taken place so far from monetary policy into the economy, and there are those uh, who feel they say it's happened very fast this time and it's kind of up to date. Uh, where are you on that continuum? Um, so there's a long-running debate uh, about the lags between changes in financial conditions and the response to those changes from economic activity and inflation, right? So we, we know that in the modern era, financial conditions move in anticipation of our decisions, and that has clearly been the case in this cycle. So in a sense, the clock starts earlier than it, than it used to, but that doesn't necessarily change the process and from that point on, and, and it's not clear that it has. We also, we, this is, I'll tell you what we know and then what we don't know. We, we know that financial conditions affect data. economic activity and inflation with a lag that can be long and variable, or lags plural. We know plural, if we had the data, we would know what to do. A lot of uncertainty so around know, at the length of the lags, and by the way, that's just one component of the broader uncertainty that we face. So I'll tell you how I, how I think about this. First, the first thing to say is we're determined to bring inflation down to 2% over time, and we will use our tools to do that. No one should doubt that. Um, I would look at it this way, though. The, the real federal funds rate is now in meaningfully positive territory. If you take the nominal federal funds rate, subtract a mainstream estimate of near-term inflation expectations, you get a real federal funds rate that is well above most estimates of the longer-term neutral rate. So I would say monetary policy is restrictive, more so after today's decision, uh, meaning that it is putting downward pressure on economic activity and inflation. We'll keep monetary policy restrictive and, until we think it's not appropriate to do so. So that's how I think about it. I mean, it, I, if I sum it up, I would say we've come a long way. We are resolutely committed to returning inflation to our 2 percent goal over time. Inflation has proved repeatedly has proved stronger than we and other forecast forecasters have expected. And at some point, that may change. Um, we have to be ready to follow the data. And given how far we've come, we can afford to be a little patient as well as resolute as we let this unfold. On the, on the credit side, I'm wondering if you saw anything in the, in the latest SLUS data that made you think you're getting a quantum of credit contraction beyond what you'd expect. Uh, the bank lending data really is the growth rates edging down towards and below, heading below zero, which is usually uh, you know, an a recession indicator. So I guess the, the, the sluice will come out early next week. And I would just say it's, it's broadly in condition, it, it, consistent with what you would expect. You've got uh, lending conditions tight and getting a little tighter. You've got weak demand. And you know it, it, it gives a picture of, of pretty tight credit conditions in the economy. I think it's really hard to tease out whether how much of that is from this source or that source. But I think what matters is the overall picture is of tight and tightening lending conditions. And that's, that's what this, this sluice will say. Uh, yes, so do, do the aliens... Hi, Chair Powell. Rachel Siegel from the Washington a, Post. Thanks for taking our questions. Is it their Could fault? you break do down the, the reasons data? why inflation has fallen and what share of that credit you would give to factors that don't stem directly from rate hikes or that might be within your control at all, like easing supply chains and a drop in energy prices over the past year? Yeah. 
Um, so, <clears throat> interesting question. So, let me start by saying that the inflation surge that we saw uh, in the pandemic resulted from a collision of elevated demand and, and constrained supply. Sure, pal, real quick, um, this data, do the aliens have the data? Sure, pal, is that, is that why you don't have it? It's expected that the disinflationary process would stem from both from the normalization of those broad pandemic-related supply and demand conditions no and sense. from restrictive, restrictive monetary policy, which would help return the balance between supply and demand by restraining demand. And we think that's broadly what we're, what we're seeing. So to, to go break it down a little further, of course, headline inflation has come down sharply from elevated levels as energy and food prices have come down, mostly due to reversal of the effects from the war in Ukraine. Uh, and that's, that's a good thing, and the public experience is that, as I mentioned earlier. For core inflation, uh, I'd say there also there has been a role for, for, most, for, for, for both factors, both uh, that I mentioned. Um, clearly, uh, in, for goods, normalization of supply conditions is, is playing an important role, as is the, um, the reversal, the beginning of the reversal of spending back into services and away from goods. Um, and for, say, take autos as an example. The combination of an increase in sales and inventories, uh, while uh, while vehicle inflation has decelerated, points to a, a substantial role for supply. But there's also a role for demand, as you know, the rate, loans and things like that are, are more expensive. So they're both working there. Uh, housing services inflation now starts to move down. Clearly, higher rates have have slowed the housing market. Um, uh, you know, I would say monetary policy is working about as we expect, and we think it, we think it'll play an important role going forward. In particular, in non-housing services, where really we think that's that's where the labor market uh, will come in as a very very important factor. So we, we think both of those both of those uh, sources of disinflation are playing an important role. I see. And just to follow up, do you think that of those two sources, that core will rely more heavily on seeing an impact from rate hikes, or is there? A more even split there too. I, I think monetary policy is going to be Im- important going forward because we, we we're sort of reaping now the benefits of the of the reversal of some of the very specific pandemic things. We're seeing that with goods in particular, uh, with, with supply chains and shortages moving, and we're seeing. So so I think going forward, monetary policy will be important, particularly in that in the sector, uh, in the non-housing services sector. That could be. Edward. Well, first, uh, let me compliment your tie, the choice of tie. That's a terrible way to start. Um, Get out. So thanks for taking our question. So the Beige Book, it said input cost pressures remain elevated for services firms, but eased notably for manufacturing sector. Is that an indication that there's a a wage inflation pressure? And how do you target and pressure on the wage inflation without pushing the economy into recession? I think the... As it relates to goods, it's really an indication that that supply chains and, and shortages are easing. And so, what was the first part of it? So, so uh, wage inflation. Like, how do you how do you target wage inflation without pushing an economy into a recession? I, I don't I don't think we're targeting wage inflation. I, th- I think what we're what we're looking for is a broad cooling in labor market conditions, and that's what we're seeing. So, wages have actually been gradually moving down. They're still at levels what would that would be consistent over a long period of time with 2% inflation. Nonetheless, we're making progress there. And by so many in- indicators, labor market demand is cooling. You can you can look at surveys by workers and businesses who see that. You, you can look at the quits rate normalizing. You can look at job openings coming down. Um, you can look at just job creation in the, in the uh, establishment survey has, you know, it's still at a high level, but it was at really an extraordinarily high level for most of the last two years. So you see cooling, particularly in, in private sector in the last, uh, you know, in the last report. So I think we see that, and it's happening at a gradual pace. So that's actually not a bad thing, in a sense, because it, it, if, if what we see is a labor market, very strong demand for labor, which is really the engine of the economy. People are, are getting hired, many people going back to work, are getting, high, getting wages, said it. spending money, and that's really what's driving the economy. But that it's gradually slowing, it's gradually cooling. That's that's a good prescription for getting where we want to get. But still we see a push to raise minimum wage. We're seeing a lot of unions go on strike or threaten strike. And the common thing is they come out with agreements like big pay <clears throat> increases, like UPS, and we have the auto workers coming up. Are you concerned then about a trend of series of big unions, these contract pushing wage inflation then? Not for us to comment on, uh, on contract negotiations, not our job, not our role. 
um, you know, we, we monitor these things and we'll, we'll keep an eye on them. But uh, really, that's something that's that's handled at that level. And, and not, yes. Hi, Victoria Guido with Politico. Um, I wanted to ask about the SCP, uh, which suggests that you would cut rates as overall and core PCE get to around or under 3%. And so I'm wondering, is the level of inflation um, what's sort of important there as you think about getting to 2% and when you might start cutting rates? Or is the speed at which inflation is falling also important? I, I think Sorry, you take the both data. into account. I think you take everything into account when you start cutting rates. It would, it would depend on, a, on the whole on a wide range of things. And when, when people are writing down rate cuts next year, you know, it's, it's, it, it just is a sense that inflation is coming down and we're comfortable that it's coming down and it's time to start cutting rates. I think, but I mean, it's, there's a lot of uncertainty between what, what happens, you know, in the next meeting cycle, let alone the next year, let alone the year after that. So it's, uh, it's hard to say exactly what, what happens there, what, what's motivating people. So if it's sort of if it's sort of stubbornly and maybe the high twos, you wouldn't necessarily cut rates. I'm not. I'm not I saying see. that at all. I'm not giving you any numerical guidance around that. I'm saying we would we'd we be comfortable that. cutting rates when we're comfortable we cutting rates, and that won't be this year. I don't think it would be. No, you know, many people okay. wrote down rate cuts for next year. I think the median was several for next year, and that's just going to be a judgment that we have to make then, a full year from now, and it, it'll be about how confident we are. That inflation is in fact coming down to our two percent. We will have goal. the data by then. By then. Uh, a good part of Wall Street has become more confident that the Fed is going to be able to engineer a soft landing, and uh, they've reduced their forecasts for a recession. And I'm wondering if the staff has changed its view on the likelihood of a recession being likely, and if you personally have changed your view in terms of becoming more confident that you can achieve a soft landing. So um, it's, it has been my view consistently that we do have a shot, and my base case is that we will be able to achieve uh, inflation moving back down to our target without the kind of really significant downturn that results in high levels of job losses that we've seen in some past uh, in some past instances, many past instances of, of tightening that look like ours. That's been my view. That that is that's uh, that's still my view. Um, and I think, you know, that that's sort of consistent with with um, with what I see uh, today. So but it's it's a long way from assured. And, and you know, we we have a, we have a lot left to go to see that happen. He's so he's the staff short. now has uh, a noticeable slowdown in growth starting la uh, later this year in the forecast. But given the resilience of the economy recently, they are no longer forecasting a recession. Um, it's, I just want to note that, it's, uh, that our staff produces its own forecast, which is independent of the forecast that we, as FOMC participants, produce. Did Having an independent did? staff forecast as well as the individual uh, participant forecast is a really a strength of our, of our process. Um, there's just a lot of, um, I think, constructive diversity of opinion that, that, that helps us make, uh, help, informs our deliberations, helps us make, um, I hope, better decisions. It, and is the reason for optimism that need all the help they inflation get. has come down and you still have a strong labor market? I mean, does that uh, add to the optimism? I wouldn't use the term optimism tell you about, the data, about this yet. I would, data I would say, though, that there's a pathway. Or not. And yes, that's, that's, that's a good way to think about it. We've, we've seen so far the beginnings of disinflation without any real costs in the labor market. And that's a, that's a really good thing. Um, I would just also say the historical records suggest that there's very likely to be some softening in labor market conditions. And consistent with having a soft landing, you would, you would have some softening in, in labor market conditions. And that's still likely as we, as we go forward with this process. But it's, it's a good thing to date that we haven't, we, we haven't really seen that. We've seen softening through other, not through unemployment, not through higher unemployment. Mostly We've seen in our softening ice cream. through uh, seen you know, soft. job openings coming yeah, not down. Not really in the economy. But. Part of the way back to more normal levels. The quits rate, so people are not quitting as much. Um, we've seen participation, people coming in, and so labor supply has, has improved, which has, which has lowered the temperature in the labor market, which was quite overheated, uh, you know, uh, going back a year or so. So we're, we're seeing that kind of cooling, and that's, that's very healthy. And, um, you know, we hope it continues. Jeff. 
<laughs> yeah, the softening you, will be in the ice Cox cream. Just to to um, you and other Fed officials in the past have suggested that you don't need to keep hiking until inflation hits 2%. That um, as long as you see continued progress. So I'm wondering what if it how never close hits do you 2%? need to get with the inflation numbers coming down? Oh um, how many months of data <laughs> do you need to see that will that will give you sufficient confidence? Okay. And um, you know, how, 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 how far does this fight need to go before you're willing to kind of declare victory on it? So the idea that we would keep hiking, hiking until inflation gets to 2 percent, it would be a prescription of, of going way past the target. That, that's clearly not the appropriate way to think about it. So um, in effect, if you look at our forecasts, we, we uh, the median participant, and again, these are these are forecasting out years, so take them with a grain of salt, but um, people you get are, our are forecasts from the local because, weather station. Because, you know, the federal funds rate is at a restrictive level now. So if we see inflation coming down, credibly, sustainably, then we don't need to be at a restrictive level anymore. We can, you know, we can move back to a, to a, a neutral level and then below a neutral level at a certain point. I think we would, you know, we, would, we of course would be very careful about that. We'd really want to be sure that inflation is coming down in a sustainable level. What if level. it and never it's, comes it's make, down, Chair Powell? I'm not going to try what? to make a numerical assessment of when and where that would be, but that's, that's the question, way I would actually. think about it is... Um, You'd start. You'd stop raising long before you you got to two percent inflation, and you'd start cutting before you got to two percent inflation too. Because we, we don't see ourselves getting to two percent inflation until, you know, all the way back to two until, two thousand twenty five or so. So. Thank you, Chair Powell. Jennifer Schoenberger with Yahoo Chair Finance. P. It's been over four months since a handful of regional banks, including Silicon Valley Bank, failed. When you look at credit conditions now, given Bank of California's acquisition of PacWest, mm, Pac does West this acquisition suggest the full impact has not been felt, or are you comfortable saying that we've seen most of the ripple effects that may have occurred at this point, and how does this play into your outlook for policy? So I, I don't want to comment on any particular merger proposal, but but I will say um, things have settled down uh, for sure out there. Deposit flows have stabilized. Capital and liquidity remain strong. Aggregate bank lending was stable quarter over quarter and is up significantly year over year. Banking sector profits generally uh, are coming in strong this quarter. And overall, the banking system remains strong and resilient. Of course, we're still watching, uh, you know, the situation carefully. And monitoring, uh, you know, monitoring conditions in in the banking sector. In terms of, of the uh, the actual effect uh, on, if you think of, of a, a particular set of banks that were that were affected because of their size and business model and things like that, that were more affected by the turmoil in March than others. It's it's very hard, as I as I mentioned, it's very hard to sort of tease out the effects on this very large economy of ours from them tightening. They may be tightening a little bit more, probably are, than other banks. The SLUS has been telling us for more than a year that banking conditions yes. are tightening. That process is ongoing, and that will restrain economic growth. So I think, I think we have to take a step back from I, I can't separate those anymore. I think, I think basically we're just looking at the, at the overall picture, which is one of tightening credit conditions, and that's that's going to restrain economic activity. It is restraining economic activity. So oh, no. that's how I would look at it. Oh, and how no. is that informing your outlook for setting policy? Hmm. <clears throat> so I think we that that goes that is an expected result of of tightening interest rate policy. Is that is that bank credit conditions would bank lending conditions would tighten as well? And so the question is, is it is it more effective this time because of what happened in May? I, I just don't think we know that. I think I think we're looking at the current data. What do in you GDP know? And we're seeing strong spending. We're seeing a strong economy. It may one thing. And it's made what us confident know? that we can go ahead and raise interest rates now for the third time since the March events. Uh, we and I, it seems it seems like the economy is is weathering this well, but of course we're watching it carefully and. Um, and expect to continue to do that. You, what do you know? Name one thing. Name a thing. Anything. Hi, Chair Just Powell. Thanks for taking our questions. Megan Casella with Barron's. I so, wondered on wages if you were at all concerned about any inflationary impact of wages now outpacing inflation, which is likely contributing to the boost in consumer sentiment and the continued strength of the consumer that we've been seeing. Well, 
wages yeah. in excess of inflation means real wages are positive. Again, that's a great thing. Of course, we want that. We want people to have real wages, but we, we want wages to be going up at a level that's consistent with, with uh, 2 percent inflation over time. As I mentioned, nominal wages have been coming down gradually, and um, that's what we want to see. We expect to see more of that. That's just more of what's consistent over a longer period of time. We don't really think that, that wages were an important cause of inflation in the first year or so of the outbreak. But I, I would say that, that wages are probably an important issue going forward. Labor market conditions broadly are going to be an important part of, uh, of getting inflation back down. And that's why we, we think we need some further uh, softening in labor market conditions. This goes sort of the, to the balance of risks question, but you mentioned at the start how um, you're keeping an eye on consumer activity and whether there might be some sort of a rebound there. And I'm curious what the Fed's explanation is, would be to families if further interest rate hikes start to hit um, the labor market, start to um, you know drive that sentiment back down. What's the message there of, of why you continue to keep uh, rates elevated or to raise them? Well, you know, we have a job assigned to us by Congress to get inflation under control. And we think the, the single most important thing we can do to benefit those very families, especially families at the lower end of the income spectrum, is to get inflation sustainably under control and restore price stability. We think that is the most important thing we can do now, and we're determined to do that. And I would just point out that the, the people who are the most hurt by inflation right away are people who are on a low fixed income who, you know, when you're talking about Not travel, just right you know, away, all you the know, time. transportation costs, heating costs, clothing, food, things like mm -hmm. that. Those, if, you, if you're just making it through each month on your paycheck and prices go up, you're in trouble right away. E even middle class people have some resources and can absorb inflation. People, the People in the lower end of the income spe spectrum have a harder time doing that. So we need, to, we need to get this done. And, you know, the record is clear that, that if, we, if we take too long or, or if, if, um, if we don't succeed, that, that the pain will only be greater. So that's, that's how I would explain what we're doing. Thank you, Chair Powell. Uh, Simon Urbinovich with The Economist. Um, you had said last month that this meeting this week was going to be a, a live one. Uh, in the event, the market had assigned a you know, roughly 99% probability to the rate move that you announced today. Uh, the decision was, of course, unanimous, um, and the statement was basically unchanged from last month. So may, may I ask, you know, to what extent was the meeting actually a live one? Was there ever any doubt over the past two days about what the decision was, was actually going to be? Well, I mean, you could. Was there doubt? I, look, I would say there's a range of views on the committee. Clearly when there you've seen was, the minutes I in see. three weeks, you'll see that there's a range of views about what we should do at this meeting and what we should do at the next meeting, and it's a it's a process that we go through. Many times when we go into a meeting, the decision is not, you know, fundamentally in doubt. Nonetheless, we have the meeting, and um, some some uh, some meetings are, are you know less uncertain than others, and and. Uh, I just leave it at that. <clears throat> Evan Reiser, Market News International. Thank you, Chair Powell. Um, financial Chair conditions Powell. have been loosening at a like fairly um, steady clip in recent weeks. The dollar, the stock market, market etc. Uh, what does that mean for the Fed and being sure that inflation will come down to target? So we monitor, of course, financial conditions, broad financial conditions. You're right; it's the dollar and equities, but and you know we're of course very focused on rates and our own policy. Um, you know, we will we're going to use our policy tools to uh, working through financial conditions to get inflation under control. The implication is, you know, we will do what it takes to get inflation down. And in principle, that that could mean that if financial conditions get looser, we have to do more. But what, what tends to happen, though, is financial conditions get in and out of alignment with what we're doing. And, and ultimately, over time, we get where we need to go. If I could also ask um, about the SCP from June that showed rate cuts, um, do you expect the Fed to cut nominal rates next year while also continuing QT? So that, that could happen. The question is, you know, is that consistent with, with – so if you think about both of them as normalization, imagine it's a world where things are okay and it's time to bring rates down from uh, what are restrictive levels to more normal levels. Uh, normalization in the case of, um, of the balance sheet would be to reduce QT. So 
um, to or to continue it. You know, you, you depending on where you are in the cycle. So there are two independent things, and you know, the, really the active tool of monetary policy is rates. But you can imagine circumstances in which it would be uh, appropriate to to have them working in what might be seen to be dis different ways, but that wouldn't be the case. Go to Kyle. Uh. I'm Thanks, not Chair sure, Powell. Buddy Powell. Kyle Campbell with American Banker. I have a question about uh, the discount window. And I'm wondering if since uh, the bank failures of the spring, if you've seen signs that banks have taken more steps to be proactive in assuring that they're ready to use that facility if they need to. Um, and if you have any sort of thoughts on whether policies might be appropriate for making sure that banks sort of test regularly to, to show that they are prepared to use it. Thanks. So that's a very important uh, thing yes and b yes to both sides of that you know yes banks are are now working to it's your power minutes see that they are ready GDT to use the discount reply. window and we are strongly encouraging them to do that banks broadly um we did find as you know during the uh, events of march and and that you know that it, that it's a little clunkier it can be a little clunkier and not as quick as you as it needs to be sometimes so why not be in a situation where where you're just much more ready in case you in case you need to access the disc discount window? Valid point. Valid point. Mr. Chairman, Mark Hamrick with Bankrate. Uh, you've talked in the past about getting the housing market. A few more questions left, probably, guys. Please keep hitting the like, smash them, subscribe. We've had a good amount of subscribers. Let's catch a few more. We can get a thousand likes with your help. Get after it. Constrained inventory of existing homes that might otherwise be coming onto market at a time when existing homeowners are reluctant to move. And of course, all, all of that happening with the 30 uh, year fixed rate mortgage still around 7% on the heels of Fed tightening and with what you're talking about, tightening industry lending standards. Are we getting closer to balance or farther away? What's your sense? I think we've got a ways to go to get back to balance, really, for the reasons that you talked about. With existing homes, uh, you know, there are many people who have low-rate mortgages, and whereas they might want to sell in a normal uh, situation, they're not going to because they have such so much value in their mortgage, which means that supply of existing homes is really, really tight, which is keeping prices up. On the other hand, there's you know there's a lot of supply coming online now. And, and there are people coming in, a lot of the buyers are, are you know, first time buyers coming in at buying it, you know, at, with these, um, you know, with these relatively elevated mortgage rates. But I think this will take some time to work through more, hopefully more supply comes online and, uh, you know, we, we work through it. Um, we're still living through the, um, you know, the aftermath of the, of the pandemic. We'll go to Nancy for the last question. Nancy, get her up here, Hi, Nancy. Hi, Chair Powell. Nancy Marshall-Genser with Marketplace. Uh, Russia has pulled out of an agreement allowing shipments of grain safe passage through the Black Sea and alternative routes at this ooh, point ooh. could he, be closed he, off. say that still, uh, Just Black wondering sea? how could that contribute to higher food prices and inflation generally, and how closely are you watching that? We are, we are watching it, of course, very closely. Um, and you're right, the withdrawal from the Black Sea Grain Initiative does raise concerns about global food security, particularly for, for poorer uh, countries that import a large share of their food. Grain prices did go up on this news, but they remain well below their peaks of last spring. And the moves that we've seen so far, I would say, are not expected to make a significant contrib contribution to U.S. inflation. Of course, we will be watching that situation carefully. So you don't think it would have a big effect on Fed policy at this point? Yes. Doesn't yes. you? You wouldn't say so, looking at what we what we know now. Thank you. Thanks very much, thank Nancy. Thank you, guys. This has been another Chirpow packed FOMC meeting. Spice was low, but we had some really great engagement, great chat during the live. Love it, guys. We'll be live again Friday with your regular. You choose the trade charting analysis. You guys will pick trades for me. I'll lose money. Uh, wrapping it up here, we see the dollar is down from where we started. Stocks and Bitcoin literally exactly where they started. Not a lot of mix up. Uh, there's definitely some dovish tone, however, not as much as I had hoped. Uh, pretty much saying we're going to expect interest rate hikes into the into next year. Dovish on the data being better, but not quite where they want it. Chirp how, honestly, we've done this for years, two years, more. He sounds like chat GBT. Like he doesn't answer the question and he just like kind of rewords the question and asks you and you're like, no, give me numbers. And they're in chat GBT. He's like, no, I won't. 
Anyway, guys, make sure you subscribed, liked. Thank you for joining us. Get in the Discord. Chat never ends there. 24-7 crypto talk and shenanigans. Love you guys. Sign up for Fairdesk, Femex, our sponsor.